my name is Jessica and I'm an educator at Harris Lake County Park and we're here today in our Longleaf Restoration Area to read Long Needle by Anne Marshall Runyon, which is a really awesome book that celebrates the special ecosystem. Long Needle by Anne Marshall Runyon. This story was inspired by an old longleaf pine in North Carolina's coastal plain. Riddled with woodpecker holes, the dead tree lay decaying among living longleaf pines where red cockaded woodpeckers maintained an active cluster in the forest. Longneedle is referred to as a she rather than it. Our language lacks a pronoun for a being, like a pine tree, that is both male and female at the same time. 1. Out of the Ashes In the year of 1696, a winged pine seed helicopters to the forest floor, takes root in the sandy soil, and sprouts six green needles. More needles emerge as the longleaf pine seedling grows for two years, nestled in the wire grass beneath a 400-year-old tree. The sky darkens as an early spring storm rumbles closer. Crack! Lightning zaps the top of the old pine tree. A deep gash burns all the way down her thick trunk, and the wire grass below bursts into flames, scorching the pine seedling's needles. Sparks ignite during the evening. A low fire dances across the hills, blazing the pine straw under the widely spaced trees. The fire burns the grasses, flowers, and shrubs, but thick bark protects the tall longleaf pines. A scarlet snake burrows deep inside his pine stump. Flying squirrels sail between the trees and land, scrambling to safety, high above the flames inside the nest cavities of turkey oaks. Thunder growls. Raindrops hiss in the flames, splattering the ashy soil. Smoke swirls away from the charred plants. The rain cools the seedling as the fire sizzles down the hillside and dies out before dawn. Days later, the little pine's scorched needles drop to the ground, exposing a tiny white tip of her stem, her growing bud. Long Needle survived her first fire. Each night after the fire, Long Needle drinks water, enriched with ashes and nutrients, to feed her growing bud. Sharp needles poke through the silvery scales that protected her bud during the fire. Animals that flood the fire return to the area. A week after the fire, a gray fox rests beside singed Long Needle. A six-lined race runner peeks out of an animal burrow. The fire burned most of the small trees and shrubs growing in the sandy soil of the Longleaf Forest. Many of the plants, such as turkey oak and blueberry, will regrow. The fire, however, kills most of the young loblolly pines. This is good news for Long Needle. Loblolly pine trees grow quickly, and if they survived the fire, they would shade and stunt the growth of the longleaf pine seedling. Long Needle is a true fire pine, thriving where frequent fires clear away competing trees creating an open, grassy, florist floor. Bright blades of grass and tender flower tips emerge from the ashes. More of the animals that flood the fire return. A southern hognose snake winds its way toward pineland star grass. By summer, a colorful meadow surrounds Longneedle. Stimulated by the spring fire, the wiregrass blooms and turns golden in the fall. Long Needle maintains her evergreen color throughout the seasons. 2. Underground Connections Long Needle's taproot reaches deep and holds her fast in the sandy, mineral-laden soil of the old-growth longleaf pine land. Led by sensitive root tips, the pine seedling's lateral roots radiate outward. Long Needle grips the ground and her roots tickle the tiny, seed-like spores of a fungus called Amanita, resting dormant in the soil. Awakened, the spores fuse with the roots and absorb their sweet sap. The Amanitas wrap around Long Needle's roots and send hyphae threads through the soil. The hyphae absorb water, minerals, and other nutrients. They share food with Long Needle, their host tree, in exchange for her sugary sap. The fungi and the trees help each other survive in a landscape shaped by fire. Amanita is a mycorrhizal fungus, a special fungus that forms a partnership with longleaf pine roots. 
Amanita's hyphae touch and fuse with other Amanita hyphae which are attached to the roots of nearby trees. After a rain shower, the Amanitas sprout pale mushrooms on the forest floor. The mushrooms open their umbrella-like caps, exposing a petticoat of gills loaded with tiny spores. Breezes scatter the ripe spores across the forest and they settle into the soil, waiting to connect with other pine tree roots. Two snails and a mantle slug feast on Amanita's gills and swallow spores along with the tender flesh. A red-bellied snake hunts the man mantle slug and snails. All of these animals spread Amanita's spores in their feces as they travel across the forest floor. There are many fungi in longleaf pine forests. Not all fungi that live with trees form these helpful partnerships with their host tree. Many simply eat from their host without giving anything in return. These fungi are called wood rotters. Honey mushrooms and red heart fungi are wood rotters that lurk in knot needles forest. Honey mushrooms are one of box turtles' favorite foods to eat. Another beneficial mycorrhizal partner of long needle is rhizopogon, and it lives underground, safe from fire. The fruits of a rhizopogon ripen underground. Box squirrels dig them up, eat them, and later spread their fungal spores throughout the forest in their droppings. Scientists discovered that mother trees in old growth forests like long needles send nutrients and chemical messages to their younger relatives through underground mycorrhizal connections. For example, a tree attacked by insects may produce repellent chemicals in its leaves and use its underground connections to stimulate other trees to do the same. Longneedle, Rhizopogon, and the Amanitas are joined with the ancient longleaf pine forest community connected and nurtured for thousands of years by vast underground networks of tree roots and fungi. The soil under long needle pulses with constant exchanges of water, nutrients, and chemicals flowing beneath between the pine trees and fungi. 3. Wetland Neighbors Long needle grows deep roots in dry sandy soil on the side of a broad hill in the sand hills region of the coastal plain. At the top of the hill is an ephemeral or temporary pond. Water collects in the ephemeral pond during the cooler rainy season and dries up during the hot summer. Fish cannot survive in an ephemeral pond. Amphibians, such as the gopher frog and tiger salamander, use the ephemeral ponds to breed and lay their eggs during winter. The aquatic larvae hatch, grow, mature into adults, and leave the ephemeral pond before it dries up. Farther down the hillside from Longneedle, the sand rests on a dense clay layer that holds water close to the surface. The soil is always moist, and a wetland community called a seep flourishes there. Carnivorous pitcher plants, meadow beauties, cinnamon ferns, toothache grasses, lilies, and orchids crowd together with many other plants in the damp moss. Mud salamanders also live there. A pine woods tree frog hunts for insects on tall yellow pitcher plants, and a shrew searches for snails and insects. Fire-dependent pond pines thrive in the seep. Unlike loblolly pines, Pond pines are able to heal themselves by growing new needles and branches after being burned. Fire stimulates their cones to open and drop seeds. Further down from the seep, a small stream emerges with a burble and meanders through Longneedles Forest, eventually joining a river that flows toward the Atlantic Ocean. Along the stream, longleaf pine trees give way to pond pines, loblolly pines, red maples, black gums, and sweet bay magnolias as well as a dense understory of gallberries, red bays, switch canes, and vines. Twink! A green tree frog calls from the water's edge in spring. Many animals that forage around Longneedle find shelter in these wetlands. During summer, Palamedes swallowtail butterflies lay their eggs on red bay plants. Warblers nest in the cane, and at dusk, big-eared bats hunt for insects in tangled vines and leaves that hang over the water. Deer, opossums, raccoons, weasels, 
Wolves and foxes find water, food, and shelter in the streamside forest. Black bears follow the streams, eating tender greens, insect larvae, and berries. Beavers build dams along the stream and create new wetlands in the dry pinelands. Four, people in the pines. Longneedle's pine forests in the North Carolina sandhills are part of an ancient longleaf forest ecosystem that spreads across the entire coastal plain of the southeastern United States. Near the Atlantic Ocean, the longleaf pine flatwoods and grassy savannas grow next to tangled evergreen pocosins. In the swampy pocosins, pond pines replace the longleaf pines as the dominant tree. Pocosins are a naturally occurring freshwater evergreen shrub bogs or wetlands found along the Atlantic coastal plain of the United States, from southern Virginia to northern Florida. An example of a pocosin is on the left side of the illustration, and the right side of the illustration is an example of a savanna. Centuries before Europeans and Africans arrived, American Indians lived in the coastal plains with a rhythm of fire, storm, and seasonal changes. Tuscarora Indians lived among Longneedle's ancestors for generations. They set wiregrass fires to clear land for their small settlements and open up the forest floor for better hunting. The fires also helped maintain open, longleaf pine forests. The Indians gathered herbs, roots, fungi, and berries from these sunny forests. They grew corn, beans, squash, pumpkins, melon, and potatoes. Many fished in the nearby rivers and sounds. The Tuscarora skirmished with other tribes, avenging the death of their warriors by killing or capturing enemy warriors. After European colonists arrived, the Indians traded deer skins and enemy captives as slaves to the colonists in exchange for useful new tools such as guns, ammunition, and a variety of metal wares. The European and African newcomers also brought deadly new diseases such as smallpox and... measles to the Indians, and sadly, many died. The colonists claimed the pine lands, clearing away ancient forests to build roads, forts, towns, and fields. In 1696, as Longneedle sprouts, England requests the American colonies to supply naval stores for the Royal Navy. Naval stores are forest products such as timber, tar, pitch, turpentine, and rosin used in shipbuilding. Harvesting the vast longleaf pine forests covering the coastal plain was profitable for both England and the American colonies. Tall pines were cut into timbers for masts, spars, and planking. Oak timbers were used to build sturdy holes. Dead pine wood contained resin and was burned to produce tar. Tar was then boiled to make pitch. Resin, collected from living pines, was distilled into turpentine and rosin. 5. Rising Above the Flames In 1704, Longneedle's taproot grows deeper and her mycorrhizal connections expand. She also sprouts more needles from the tip of her stem. Longneedle continues to grow slowly and protects her fragile bud. Her needles regrow quickly after another spring fire crackles under the pines. Longneedle is an 8-year-old tree, but she resembles a clump of evergreen grass. During Longneedle's twelfth winter, a fierce nor'easter wind roars across the forest. The ancient, lightning-scarred, longleaf pine tree that towers over Longneedle crashes to the ground. After the storm passes, Longneedle glistens in the sunshine. Spring rains and warm sun wash over the pine lands. The seedling's green needles harvest the energy of the sun with chlorophyll, producing a sugar called glucose that fuels her growth. Longneedle stretches straight up toward the warm, shining sun. Within two years, Longneedle becomes a six-foot-tall pole with bright green needles bristling all along her skinny trunk. During late fall, two Tuscarora hunters set fire to the hills. Longneedle is a skinny 14-year-old pole. More hunters hide downwind with spears, bows, and arrows ready to slay animals that flee the fire. The Tuscarora feed their families with the meat and use the hides to make clothing. The flames singed Longneedle's thick, flaky bark and bristling green needles, but her growing bud waves high above the fire, and the young fire pine again survives. 
Each spring, several new buds emerge along Long Needle's stem and form curving branches that resemble tall white candles. Long Needle continues to rapidly grow. Green needles crowd along new growth, and birds such as brown headed nuthatches and red cockaded woodpeckers probe for hidden insects. As Long Needle grows taller, her lower branches that are shaded die and break off. Fire burns across the pine lands every few years, and the shrubby turkey oaks near Long Needle burn to the ground each time. Neighboring turkey oaks located just over the hill from Long Needle escape the Tuscarora's fire and grow into small trees. Over time, they also become tall enough to resist later fires and form a beautiful oak grove. Fox squirrels, deer, and turkeys enjoy eating the acorns. Long Needle's graceful branches curve outward and upward, holding the green needles safe above the dancing flames. The fire pine grows taller and her bark thickens. Six, cones and seeds, plenty for all. 1710. Long Needle is still a six foot tall skinny pine growing in the sand hills. Swiss and German colonists build the town of New Bern at the mouth of the Neuse River, and the Tuscarora Indians who live south of the new town join together under Chief Hancock and battle to regain their territories. 1711. The Tuscarora lost the war and also their homelands to the colonists. After the Tuscarora War, more colonial settlers moved westward across the coastal plains. These events forever changed the Longleaf Forest landscape. 1727. By the time Long Needle first blooms, valuable naval stores, tar and pitch, are produced from the open Longleaf Pine Forests, spreading across the coastal plains in the Carolinas. Colonists establish a port at Brunswick on the Cape Fear River in North Carolina. The naval stores were rafted down the river in barrels and loaded onto large ships at Brunswick. The ships sailed north to Philadelphia, New York, and Boston, where merchants exported the barrels across the Atlantic to England. These commodities were the backbone of the colonial economy, as England needed tar and pitch for the Royal Navy and also to sell to other countries. The Carolina parakeet, right, is an extinct parrot species and the only parrot species native to the eastern United States. Making tar and pitch is very difficult work and mostly done by slaves. Dead longleaf pine wood, heavy with resin, is gathered and burned inside earthen kilns. Tar oozes out from the bottom of the hot kiln, leaving a pile of charcoal inside. Tar, boiled in huge kettles, produces sticky pitch. The tar is used to strengthen and preserve a sailing ship's rigging, which is made of rope. Pitch coats a, sh a ship's hull sealing out the seawater, and repels wood-boring mollusks. In 1727, 31-year-old Longneedle is almost 50 feet tall when she sprouts clusters of purple male flowers along her branches. Male longleaf flowers begin to grow in late winter to early spring. The flowers grow up to three inches long and turn rosy pink as they fill with pollen. In early spring, nearly all the mature longleaf pine flowers release clouds of dry yellow pollen. Long needles' tiny female flowers emerge just behind the growing tips of her branches. When just sprouting, female longleaf pine flowers are soft and pink. The twin female flowers grow upward and are fertilized when branch, uh, breezes dust everything with yellow pollen. Once fertilized, the flowers develop into stiff cones as they twist down, growing long and green. For two years, the pine cones fatten as the seeds ripen and the cones turn brown. A hungry fox squirrel cuts off a large green cone and drops it to the ground. He scampers down the pine tree, picks up the cone, and carries it to the stump where he feasts on the seeds. During the summer of 1728, a lightning fire chars the forest floor and clears it of debris. In autumn, long needles' ripe brown cones open. Winged seeds helicopter downward. Some seeds are gobbled up by birds, mammals, and ants. Hungry bobwhite quail scratch for them under the wiregrass and autumn flowers. 
a pine snake slides out from her den inside a pine stump and couch- catches a mouse nibbling on the pine seeds. Seeds that land on open ground rapidly thrust tiny roots into the earth seeking food, water, and fungal partners. Insects eat some seeds, but many others survive and sprout into seedlings around Longneedle. No fire, no seedlings. The story of a longleaf pine. In February, the longleaf pine begins to flower. Its male catkins release clouds of yellow pollen. Spring breezes carry the pollen to a tiny female flowers perched along the branches. Two years pass as the fertilized flowers mature into huge pine cones filled with large seeds. During the second summer, a small lightning fire burns the forest clear. In late October, the cones slowly open and seeds drift downward, landing near the parent tree. Many seeds are eaten, as they are a nutritious food, and some seeds never reach the ground. But one seed lands on open soil, germinates, and sends tiny roots into the sandy soil. Ashes from the summer fire and winter rains nourish the little seedling. A baby longleaf pine begins to grow. 7. A Profitable Commodity Scottish Highlanders settle in the Sandhill region during the mid-1700s and clear trees to create roads, farms, and towns. They also cut the longleaf pine forests to produce naval stores and timber. Transporting these resources through the sandy hills to distant ports is difficult and slow work. Fortunately, Longneedles Hill is left undisturbed. However, healthy underground connections between the forest tree roots and the mycorrhizal fungi are damaged by the settlers. Throughout the 18th century, Longneedle widens her trunk and thickens her bark. As her older needles fall, new needles emerge. Every six or seven years, Longneedle produces a bumper crop of cones. As Longneedle continues to mature, the American colonies form, fight against England, and win independence in 1776 to become the United States of America. Forest exploitation for naval stores in North Carolina booms during the 19th century. Merchants build railroads into the Longleaf Forest throughout the coastal plain, including Longneedle Sandhills region. Railroads make transporting the heavy timbers and barrels of tar, pitch, and turpentine through the sandy hills profitable. Landowners send workers, mostly slaves, throughout the Longleaf Forest to tap the living pines for their fragrant resin, which is collected and ladled into barrels. Mules pull wooden carts loaded with heavy barrels of pine resin to stills. The resin is distilled into liquid spirits of turpentine and hard rosin. The two pungent pine products are used to make paint, wax, lamp fuel, ink, rubber, soap, and medicine. Tacky rosin rubbed on a violin's bow makes the strings sing. Massive 400-year-old longleaf pine trees are felled for their high-grade wood and shipped by rail to sawmills. The valuable timber is used for shipbuilding and construction, making strong masts, sturdy beams, and beautiful wide floorboards. Schooners transport barrels of naval stores from North Carolina's Cape Fear River to New England ports. Tar becomes one of North Carolina's most profitable commodities earning North Carolinians the somewhat derogatory nickname Tar Heels. During the Civil War, North Carolina's Confederate troops, however, embraced the nickname Tar Heels because soldiers held their ground in battle, as if their boots were sticky with tar. By the end of the 19th century, most of the old-growth longleaf pines growing throughout the coastal plain of North Carolina are cut down. Tobacco and other crops are planted where longleaf pines once grew. Towns, farms, and roads stop lightning fires that once burned freely across the land. Longleaf pine cannot regrow without the fires. Fast-growing loblolly pines mixed with hardwoods like oak, hickory, sweet gum, and maple replace the original fire-dependent longleaf forests in North Carolina. Eight, in the heart of the tree. A storm tears off a living limb in the late summer of 1896 
and a ragged hole is left in Longneedle's protective bark. Red heart fungus from a nearby longleaf pine fruits and releases spores into the air. The spores drift and land on the hole before a long needle can seal off the wound with resin. The wood rotting fungus does not kill the tree, but slowly softens her dense inner heartwood. During World War I, Fort Bragg military base is established in the sand hills near Southern Pines. The explosive testi explosives tested and the fires burned maintain the longleaf pines and other fire-dependent species around the base. World War I also increases the demand for lumber, and many longleaf pines are timbered. To help the country recover from the Great Depression as part of the New Deal, the Croatan National Forest is established in 1936 on 50,000 acres near New Bern. The United States Forest Service employs the Civilian Conservation Corps to plant loblolly pine plantations where longleaf pine forests once grew. The U.S. Forest Service uses Smokey Bear ads to create awareness of forest fire prevention across the United States. The campaign increases the planting of loblolly plantations but limits longleaf pine re regeneration on public lands. Many farmers burn their pine forests to maintain wire grass and open up woodland for their sheep and cattle to graze. In the sand hills, seeds from long needle continue to sprout after fire clears the forest floor. Long needle is a grand 250 year old tree in 1946, topped with a crown of long twisting branches. The red heart fungus slowly grows inside of her. It matures and pushes a quirky fruiting body through the, through the bark under one of long needle's branches. A male red cockaded woodpecker lands on Longneedle's sturdy trunk. The small bird taps and listens. From the sound of the taps, the woodpecker senses that Longneedle's soft heartwood is easy to excavate. Over two years, the woodpecker chips through the tough living layers of Longneedle's trunk and digs a deep nest hole inside the rotted heartwood. He also drills shallow pits around his entrance hole. Wounded Longneedle oozes sticky resin down the trunk, trying to seal the small pits. The bird keeps the pits open because the flowing resin prevents rat snakes and ants from climbing up and bothering his nest. The red cockaded woodpecker attracts a female in early spring and she lays three eggs in the nest cavity. Together, the pair raises their babies as they grow and learn to fly by summer. The three fledglings roost with their parents in the cavity through the winter. In the spring, the young females depart to search for mates. Their brother remains to help raise the next brood while also working on his own nest hole in a nearby pine. After helping his parents for a few years, he is joined by a female. Younger brothers take his place as helpers and add more nest holes in nearby pines. In 1956, a small cluster of red cockaded woodpeckers thrive in and around Longneedle. A multi-generational family of longleaf pines shelters an extended woodpecker family Birds assist in the maintenance of a healthy forest by eating ants, bark beetles, and other insects that could potentially harm the trees. Anoles, red cockaded woodpeckers, bobwhite quail, pine elfin butterflies, red-tailed hawks, rat snakes, gray foxes, cottontail rabbits, and bluebirds are among the many animals living within Long Needles Sandhills Pine Forest. Nine, Fire Pine Hotel. Lightning strikes the top of Longneedle during the summer of 1980, and it deeply scars her trunk. For more than 80 years, red heart fungus rotted her heartwood. Longneedle could not bear the brunt of this injury, and she begins to die. The following spring, Longneedle's sap fails to rise. Resin stops flowing out of pits drilled around the red cockaded woodpecker's nest hole, and they abandon their dying tree in search of other mature longleaf pine trees to make their nests. Needles gently drop from Nong Needles' crown as a pair of bluebirds claim the abandoned nest hole and lay four brightly, bright blue eggs inside the tall tree. The bluebird family hunts for grasshoppers and caterpillars in the grasses and shrubs. The dead pine is filled with bird life again as the bluebirds return to nest for several years. One spring, a pair of pileated woodpeckers 
enlarge the old red cockaded nest hole before the bluebirds return. The new woodpeckers raise three of their young inside the dead tree that spring. These large woodpeckers hammer and tear off slabs of bark, searching for wood boring beetles and grubs in the pines, the turkey oak grove, and the streamside forest. They excavate a new nest hole above their first one. As years go by, red-headed and red-bellied woodpeckers take their turns hollowing more cavities in the dead tree. A flying squirrel moves into one of the woodpecker holes. She nurses her six helpless babies inside Long Needle for about seven weeks. The young squirrels then join their mother, foraging for seeds, nuts, berries, insects, and bird eggs. They glide across the forest at night. Long Needle continues to shed her bark and limbs, becoming a white snag in the shimmering green forest. Ten, continuity of nature. Hurricane Fran roars through the forest in the fall of 1996. Long Needle, having stood for 300 years, crashes to the ground, crushing blueberries and turkey oaks. During the spring of 1997, a male eastern fence lizard perches on the fallen log, bobbing his head in blue throat patches to attract a female. She digs a burrow and lays her eggs under Long Needle. Slowly, the old tree decays, enriching the soil. Two of Long Needle's descendants nestle beside her. They glisten in the sunlight, and a new generation of longleaf pines begins to grow straight, reaching for the sun. The Old North State. Here's to the land of the longleaf pine, the summer land where the sun doth shine, where the wheat grows strong and the strong grow great. Here's to down home, the Old North State. North Carolina Conservation Efforts. 1963. Weymouth in Southern Pines was the home of novelist James Boyd and his wife Catherine. After James's death, Catherine donated 403 acres of her family's land to the state of North Carolina, establishing the Weymouth Woods Nature Preserve. Longleaf pine forests remain protected there. 1973. The Endangered Species Act became federal law. Studies of the endangered red cockaded woodpecker's habitat helped establish the practice of prescribed burning to limit understory tree growth in longleaf forests. 1976. The North Carolina Natural Heritage Program was established to inventory and support conservation of rare plants and animals that are unique to North Carolina. 1977. The state of North Carolina purchased the Boyd Timber Tract, an old-growth longleaf pine forest for Weymouth Woods Sand Hills Nature Preserve, the oldest living longleaf pine, more than 460 years old, lives there. Her trunk is thick, gnarled, and sports a crown of twisted branches. 1977, the Federal Paperboard Company donated uh, 13,850 acres of the Green Swamp, a nas national natural landmark, to a newly established North Carolina chapter of the Nature Conservancy. The carnivorous Venus flytrap and other rare plants and animals thrive in longleaf pine savannas. 1985, botanist Joan Walker documented the amazing plant diversity in the ground cover of the green swamp's wiregrass savannas. These numbers rivaled the diversity within tropical rainforests. The Nature Conservancy and other conservation groups became more interested in restoring longleaf pine forests and broadened their views to include the whole forest, not just the trees. 1995. The Longleaf Alliance, a nonprofit organization in Alabama, formed as an information clearinghouse for longleaf pine growers throughout the longleaf range from Virginia to Texas. 2004. Looking for Longleaf, the Fall and Rise of an American Forest by Lawrence S. Early was published by the University of North Carolina Press. And today. The land continues to be slashed and separated by roads, railroads, farms, towns, and cities. Ancient underground mycorrhizal connections are broken. Fires no longer burn freely and frequently across the coastal plains. Without fire, the longleaf pines, wiregrass meadows, pitcher plants, red cockaded woodpeckers, and other amazing fire-dependent species that evolved here 
are dwindling. Longleaf Pine supporters, including state and federal agencies, private groups, and individual landowners, have joined efforts to regenerate North Carolina's longleaf pine lands. They work to create larger forests by connecting existing ones, making the land easier to burn successfully. Prescribed and controlled burns are used to restore open pine forests and preserve their unique biodiversity. Perhaps in another three centuries, old-growth longleaf pine forests like the one where need long needles sprouted may once again flourish in North Carolina. Thank you so much for reading Long Needle with us by Anne Marshall Runyon. In the month of May, we're going to be celebrating the longleaf pine forest and everything about it, so make sure to check out our website for more information on that. Bye!